The Unshackled Waves, Episode 109. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. It's now only a week until Christmas, but there are still plenty of political happenings in Australia. We've had a by-election and a resignation in federal politics. We will discuss that and other news with the Unshackled senior editor, Damien Ferry. This is the Unshackled Waves Review Show. Damien, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Now, I probably should have explained this uh, last week, uh, but the reason that you're uh, coming onto the show via the, the phone is uh, because your internet connection up there in Wollongong is not that great, so we have to rely on the old-fashioned phone lines. Yeah, a bit of technical dif- difficulties, but nevertheless, we'll pull through. Now, obviously, the big news from the weekend was the Benelong by-election result. It turned out to be a comfortable win for or the, the previous uh, Liberal member, uh, John Alexander, who will remember we, uh, the people of Benelong were forced to this uh, by-election because it was discovered he had uh, dual citizenship on the, the account of his uh, father. Uh, it was uh, obviously... Uh, Build as a high stakes uh, campaign for the, uh, the the government, and Labor had their star candidate uh, Christina Keneally, former New South Wales Premier. But you know, dis- despite all the you know the hype and the media attention, it was a comfortable win for John Alexander. In the, in the end, uh, he won with uh, fifty four point seven five of the two party preferred vote, which only represented a a swing of four point nine seven percent to Labor. Uh, so it was a pretty comfortable uh, win, and uh, yeah, you have. To, and if you watched uh, the the coverage uh, on Saturday night, you noticed Malcolm Turnbull was, you know, he was holding up John Alexander's arm. He was very, uh, he was very eager to claim this victory uh, as his own. Well, I think he, the reason he wants to do that is because he knows that uh, he's safe at least for now. Yes. Um... John Alexander was a, uh, a superstar candidate for the area. It was really a seat that the Liberals had to win. It's not a seat that I would call ultra safe, but reasonably safe. So um, even with a swing against them, which ended up being a 4.59% swing, which when it comes to by elections is actually not, not a, a big swing. It's actually re- relatively small because um, doing a little bit of statistic searching, I found that the the average swing usually at a by election is around six percent, and we've seen by elections go twenty percent and and even more um, in some by elections. And considering the the unpopularity uh, of Turnbull, he actually did very well to to claim this seat. Now, uh, it's 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 an area where really um, the Liberals just had to make an impact. I mean, Labor pulled out um, what, what they could in, in, in putting a high-profile candidate in there. But uh, with Christina Keneally, it's, it's a candidate that has a lot of baggage. So it's someone that is well-known uh, for the wrong reasons. And it doesn't seem like it was something that um, it could have been a good idea on their behalf and um, may have worked against them uh, where they could have gotten a better result. Uh, Christina Keneally in the final days of the campaign when uh, journalists were starting to really hammer her about uh, you know her connections to you know Eddie O'Bead, Ian McDonald and George Prodi, she got quite testy in those uh, interviews obviously it was you know uh, very uncomfortable and then there was also the Liberals they uh, managed to purchase the uh, web domain uh, ChristinaKeneally.com which they turned into an attack website listing uh, all of their failures and connections to these uh, corrupt politicians uh, online. Well, politicians don't like uh, having the truth exposed when it's against them. So um, it's, 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 it's quite funny how they act when, it, uh, when all of a sudden things come out against them and then they claim all, all sorts of things. Um, but the, the Liberals were really just putting out facts, straight hard facts, uh, reminding voters on her past 
which um, is a shady past. And obviously she had connections with those uh, gentlemen that you mentioned, um, being in New South Wales Parliament. And uh, at the time of her premiership, um, obviously um, didn't do anything to... Um, to seize their influence, which they had a big influence over the parliament in the in the dealings that they uh, that occurred under them. So I, I think that it's 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 really rich for her to um, to, to claim such uh, bias and um, to to go off and, and 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 whinge about these things because both parties do it, all parties, but it's just dirty. Um, well, you could call it dirty tactics, but at the end of the day, the liberals didn't really attack her. In a bad way, they just stated pure hard facts, um, which really she couldn't argue against. It's just her history. So it's not really something that uh, she could say is wrong. And um, they didn't get nasty when it came to personal uh, attributes um, of hers. It was just basically her record that, um, that she didn't want to uh, have brought up. Well, speaking of uh, dirty tactics, there was also Labor's uh, campaign in the in the final week uh, seemed to be this accusation that the Turnbull government was uh, China phobic, uh, which is it was pointed out to me is not actually a correct term. It's called uh, cynophobia, so they couldn't even <laughs> get that right. But yeah, basically saying because of. Uh, the Turnbull government's attacks on uh, Sam Dastyari over his Chinese connections and the new uh, foreign uh, influence and donation laws that apparently uh, the Turnbull government was saying to... And they didn't just... They, they started off by just talking about Chi uh, Chinese Australians, but uh, Christina Keneally even said that, oh, Turnbull's making Asian Australians feel like uh, second-class citizens. And, like, basically, you know... Tr you know, all but saying that, you know, you sh uh, because the reason they went for this line of attack is because Benelong does have a high percentage of uh, Chinese and uh, Asian voters. And so they, they, they clearly thought that, you know, th this was uh, an effective uh, line of attack. But, you know, in the end, uh, playing the race card, uh, which, you know, how often does the left do that? Uh, it it didn't, didn't have an impact in the end. Yeah, Labor, as you said, the left in general play these um, these games with minority voters. They basically use them um, as seen fit, and and they normally tend to get away with it in a lot of ways. But um, the Chinese are a lot smarter than that, and don't um, don't let uh, the Labor Party or the Greens um, use them for their votes. And this this is the thing. I mean. To claim that the Liberal Party and Malcolm Turnbull are, are, are Chinophobic or, or xenophobic, I, I think um, if you were to have any criticisms, you, you could actually say the opposite, and um, you could actually criticise that they're they're actually very China friendly. Um, if you were to take a, a more nationalistic approach um, to how you view the situation, I mean, um, they set up the the free trade agreement with China. Um, they're very pro business. I mean, the the Chinese people. Um, in general, I would say are, are very uh, highly or look highly uh, favourable to the Liberal Party um, rather than the Labor Labor Party. They're they're very business orientated people, um, very very liberal in their views. And I, I think um, I mean it's just a tactic that they always try and pull. But um, I think there would be um, more Labor supporters that would be um, having. Uh, negative views towards Chinese than there would be Liberal supporters for sure and uh, Malcolm Turnbull as you mentioned is definitely safe as leader I don't see anything happening um, till the next election to be honest unless something um, just popped out of nowhere uh, a scandal of such but I mean he's he's been able to win the the Benelong by-election he's also um, got Barnaby Joyce back into power um, so I mean two by-election wins and considering how unpopular he is, I mean, he's really done a good job in, in being... I mean, he is lucky that the, the two seats that did fall were ones that he could easily win. But in saying that, there has been big swings in the past that could have um, really damaged him and his leadership. But I think he's feeling good right now. And I think the Liberal Party in general... Um, can only look ahead and, and, and say, well, we've we, we done a good job at the campaign and um, the, the tactics the Labor Party used just didn't work. 
And at this by-election in Benelong, it was also the first test for uh, Australian Conservatives. Uh, uh, They had a reasonably high-profile candidate in uh, Joram Riker, whose brother runs the the very popular uh, Facebook and YouTube channel, uh, Viram uh, Media. Now, uh, obviously, uh, Benelong was uh, one of the 17 electorates that voted no on same-sex marriage, so people were wondering, could uh, Australian Conservatives, you know, really capture a large segment of the conservative vote but in the end they they didn't do very well they only got uh 4.3 percent of the the primary vote and most of that uh came at the expense of the christian democrats uh, fred niles party uh which uh uh, they suffered a uh, 3.3% swing against them to have a primary vote of 3.1%. And most of the uh, reduction in the Liberal primary vote, all of that went to the increase in Labor's primary vote. So there actually wasn't that much of a change in the uh, cons- uh, so, oh, conservative or, or would you call it socially conservative vote overall in Benelong. I think it was a very disappointing result for them. I, um, I mean, I, I've been on the forums, I've been on social media, and um, like always, you will see people that support the party, um, the Australian Conservatives, basically uh, highlighting positives and saying how well they did and everything. But if you really want to look at uh, things unbiasedly and, um, and do things right then whether you support the party or not, you have to really just look at, at facts and, and, and see it for what it is. I mean, I was expecting them to do very well this, this um, by-election. And the reason for that is because when you look at the demographics of this this seat of Benelong, it really has their name all over it. It It, it is one of the seats high, in Australia, in the country, I would say that Benelong would be one of the seats that would favour them most. It's uh, very uh, socially conservative with your Chinese voters, um, uh, Korean voters. Um, I mean, these these are voters that are um, against gay marriage, against safe schools, um, in turn, very economically liberal. Uh, It basically suited them to a T, but for them to just scrape um, past the 4% mark, um, which is where they are able to get their their funding back, obviously, for the 4%, and... Um, unfortunately for the Christian Democrats, they just missed out now because of the, the, the swing against them with the, with the Australian Conservatives. So um, they, they definitely will be uh, displeased at that. But like you said, yeah, I mean, most of the, the votes the Australian Conservatives got were from uh, the Christian Democrats and maybe a little slice from the Liberals, but it really wasn't a, um, a defining vote where they can say, we uh, were able to find a, uh, um, a a big demographic that voted for us. It was just um, one minor party that um, basically lost a little bit out to another minor party. It didn't really um, help at all. And even when you put the Australian Conservatives and Christian Democrats together, you only end up with 7% or so, which is basically what the Greens got. And, and for the Greens to get such a vote and in such a seat as Benelong, um, is really confusing to me. I, I think it's um, it is disappointing, and where they go from here, they they really need to um, to look at this and and see what they can do to increase their vote. Because if that's make an impact, they're going to have to pull double figures. They can't rely on on such small numbers to to only scrape past to, um, the four percent mark and getting funding. They need to really make an impact and pull huge figures to uh, get their names out there if they're to influence the the political spectrum. Uh, and it's also the the poor result of uh, Australian Conservatives that it's also made me ponder the question for Conservatives, is it just better to try and change the, the major parties? Because that is who the, the voters, you know, even though there's all this talk of, you know, minor parties, the, the voters are still voting for the major parties. So should should that be the, the way forward for Conservatives to, you know, implement um, our preferred policies? I've heard this argument um, a lot, actually, lately. There's been many people that are very conservative that uh, had stints with minor parties, and they're actually thinking of going back to the Liberal Party in trying to uh, change it from within. But I, I think that just looking at how much influence and power the left have in the major parties, 
it seems very, very hard or unlikely to be able to change it. it it's just there has been some major changes taking place as you've witnessed in Victoria with the Liberal Party starting to, to build up the, the right and, and shift to the right. But in New South Wales especially, they're really, really controlled by the left in such a way that every pre-selection, a left-wing candidate gets pre-selected. The, the amount of right-wing candidates in the Liberals is very minimal. It's um, For something to happen, it would, it would be very, very unlikely. It's just... Um, it's just too hard at this point. There would have to be some sort of major revolution of some sort within the party for this to, to take place. I mean, Tony Abbott is even, um, many have told me that uh, he may get challenged for his seat of Warringah and there might be some sort of uh, push to have him removed. So there, there really is um, a few people in the, in the Liberal Party, the moderate faction, the Turnbull faction, that uh, have been pushing and have been in control for a number of years now, and they're really uh, bloodthirsty. They're really after the, the, the right, and they've been shrinking the right uh, successfully for, for many years now. So um, it, it will be very hard to, to change within, and that's why a lot of people are turning to the miners. When it comes to the minor parties, of course, the problem is with the right is there's too many of them. So... Even though Family First has merged with Australian Conservatives, I think you're going to have to have more mergers take place uh, for a minor party to be able to really uh, be considered as a fourth major player in the political system because you've still got One Nation, the Shooters Party, you've got um, different, you know, ALA. There's, uh, there's so many different parties. You can name at least half a dozen with such a reputable name that could... Um, that, that could easily get a couple percentage points. So in saying that, they really need to start thinking, well, maybe we should start working together and that way we could be an alternative because these parties really do have similar views. There's not much difference in between them. So th this is, this may be what needs to take place rather than changing it within because the, the major parties at the moment, they're just too under control um, by a certain elite of people, unfortunately. So it's very, very difficult to do that. Labor Senator Sam Dastiari finally uh, succumbed to the uh, public uh, and also internal pressure and resigned uh, from the Senate uh, last Tuesday. Now, however, this won't uh, take effect until uh, early next year, which means he'll still be drawing a, a taxpayer uh, salary for that time. Uh, basically, the, the death blow was uh, dealt the day before on Monday where two Labour frontbenchers, uh, Catherine King and Linda Burney, said that you know, Sam should uh, consider his position. And when, you're, when your own side uh, start to say things like that, that's pretty much... Uh, the end, and it's it's a pretty big scalp uh, for the term of government because you know as we know you know Destiari was you know, uh, a major you know power broker in the uh, New South Wales right of the the Labor Party. He he was referred to uh, as a protected species because he survived uh, so, so many times over this uh, China scandal, but he's he's gone now, and yes, he certainly won't be missed. That's right, I. I mean, it, it took Shorten so many attempts to, for with calls to to get rid of him, and he just wouldn't do it. I mean, it um, it was just, oh yeah, I'll I'll just put him aside for now, and then you know, in six months later, I'll promote him back when everyone forgets. So, I mean, this this is the amount of influence this guy had. I mean, that's the Ari, uh, why he was so important and uh, why Shorten wouldn't take action was because Dastiari was a big supporter of Shorten and one was one of the key, uh, the key figures that ended up putting Shorten in his role as opposition leader. So, I mean, Shorten had a debt to pay to, um, to Dastiari. This, this is unfortunately how the political system works. And, I mean, it's, um, it, it's just... Yeah, <laughs> it's funny, but it's it's just so sad in in a way that that they act like this. It's uh, so. I mean, yeah, he won't me he won't be missed for sure. I mean, he was really just um, a, a good laugh for the opposition. I mean, um, people opposing the Labor side of politics. So any any of the the right wingers, the nationalists, like you mentioned, um, 
And I mean, he was someone that was very hypocritical of a person, like, um, especially on the issue where um, he sometimes called himself a Muslim, sometimes he called himself an atheist. And he basically used this as a, um, as a game, just as a card to um, call himself a Muslim when he wanted to act like a victim. But then in general, oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a true blue, you know, Aussie atheist that, you know, has a drink at the pub and all that sort of thing. So when you get politicians acting like this, it's just fake, non-genuine. People can see through it. And his connections, obviously, with um, New South Wales, uh, the, the past dealings with many of the other politicians... Um, it, it just it just says how corrupt the guy is, really. I mean, um, he he really didn't have a a good history, and he was parachuted into uh, federal politics. And even when he was in parliament, he he didn't really do a good job in uh, being able to convince people that he was um, to be such. Um, to be in such a high position for, for the talent that he was supposed to have. And it was quite easy to see through that he was there because he was put there uh, by particular people in the party. And he was one of the ver- worst uh, virtue signalers in the parliament. You know, he, uh, you know, of, of probably Pauline Hanson was, you know, his greatest uh, a- adversary in the parliament saying, oh, you know, how horrible and, you know, bigoted she is and, like, look at these, you know, conservatives, you know, they're so, you know, racist and homophobic and he did all those, uh, I'm not sure if you remember those, you know, Facebook videos where he'd have the, you know, background behind him, you know, mocking, you know, mm. one, na- one Nation uh, candidates and then, of course, don't forget there was his, you know, stupid book, uh, you know, One Halal of a Story, uh, which he he decided to get uh, halal certified uh, from that uh, Muhammad El Mahoney guy, who, as we remember, uh, wanted to uh, wanted Muslim men to uh, fertilize uh, Australian women. So you know that that that, that was a good one from him. Uh, I think his uh, sequel uh, to One Halal of a Story will be uh, One Chow Min of a Story. Hmm. I think Sam Dastiari um, will, will be known to, to be someone that achieved nothing, uh, was basically uh, placed there uh, because of his connections rather than his talent, and uh, was somebody that went through many scandals, um, just did nothing to the peop- for the people of Australia and New South Wales in general, and also, as you said, was somebody that really chose the lowest common denominator when it came to um, to playing games, when it, when it came to uh, virtual signalling, um, basically playing the victim, always, uh, you know, calling his opponents racist, um, homophobic, xenophobic, uh, um, very very green like, really, even um, j- just to um, to 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 take that position rather than a uh, debate on facts and, and, and actual policy, just to, to go the easy bait way, the easy bait road and, you know, oh, yeah, let's just attack people's um, character and and, um, and call them names and, and, and hopefully people in the electric can buy it. So, I, I mean, he, he just really was was such a failure as a as a political um i mean this guy was had so many aspirations i mean you know people would say oh that he's going to be leader one day he's going to be you know some sort of um big player and he he just shot himself in the foot so many times and you know damaged the party really uh, and uh, let's not forget that it was uh, only last month when uh, Australian patriot activist Neil Erickson and his uh, Patriot uh, Blue uh, crew confronted uh, Dastyari in a Melbourne uh, bar over his uh, chi- uh, China connections. And this was actually before the latest revelations uh, came out. And of course, you know, he you know played the victim after that, you know, poor me, I'm being picked on and media was like, oh, mm-hmm. you know, how outrageous, you know, these, you know, horrible you know nationalists and that and then there was you know also the um yeah one of uh, sam's mates there saying well you know i'm going to report you to uh your uh, your employer uh you know obviously sam you know thought he was on to a winner uh on that one but it turns out that neil erickson and the other nationalists that he's mocked over the years of you know had the last laugh sam's out on his ass unemployed well um you know the the nationalists they were they were right yeah, well, I'll say this much, you won't be unemployed for that much longer. 
it won't it won't take him long for him to get a put, uh, a very very cushy job as they all do. Um, this is how it works. No matter how hopeless they are, no matter what scandals they've been through, no matter how much damage they've caused. Oh yeah, you're a labour guy. No worries, we'll we'll fix you up. We'll uh, we'll we'll give you a, a cushy you know a um, couple hundred grand job a year that um, you can you know sit on your ass and uh, basically uh, uh, be a pen pusher. And um, th- this is how it works. So he's definitely, it's not going to worry him. He was always somebody that didn't really have principles, that didn't have uh, strong values. I mean, no matter what side you look at in politics, you can always spot a genuine person to a fake person. I mean, you look at someone like Shorten. I mean, he every time you talk, you know he's just full of crap. I mean, he's got no no sense of passion in what he's saying. Whereas someone like Albanese is very different. He's more passionate in his views. I mean, and then on the right side of politics, you know, you've also got people like, um, um, for instance, uh, Abbott and um, Christensen, and they're, they're, they're very um, passionate in, in what they speak of. And and then you've got others that just seem to go with the flow. And, and I mean, Turnbull is a clear example that you don't know really where he stands on things. He seems to flip-flop around doesn't really um you can't really say he is there and has strong values and and uh, and he's pushing for a, a particular way through the parliament he's he's just um they just seem to be there for the the power play for the for the opportunity the money and not not for being there for the people of Australia and this this is the thing no matter what happens to them they always end up getting a nice job afterwards so they have nothing to worry about Oh, well, there's there was already a reports uh, before he resigned that he was exploring a, a future career in uh, media. Which you know, even though he's uh, resigned from the parliament, we still have to I might put up with him on our TV screens in the future. Who knows? We might see you know Dasher on uh, you know one of the the news networks uh, soon, where he'll you know just be up to his you know usual antics again. The, the sad thing about it is that he's, he's a really poor performer. I mean, he's, it's, it's not like we can actually say that, oh, you know, we, we, we hate him, we disagree with him, but he's actually, you know, good at what he does. He's actually really poor at what he does. So, I mean, it, it's like he gets someone off the street that is uh, very biased in a particular um, political platform and, and you just get him to rant. And, and that's what he does. He just rants on about things that he doesn't like. He's not very professional. He's, he's not a, a good performer in any way or a talent. So for him to be in a media role, it's, it's quite laughable. I mean, it's going to be as cringeworthy as people like Waleed Ali and, you know, um, uh, Koch and O'Keefe and all the rest of them. It's, 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 I mean, he'll get a job. No, no worries about that. I mean, the ABC will hire him in a heartbeat. But, um, it's, it's just going to be, uh, very cringeworthy. I think a lot of people are going to have a good laugh seeing him, uh, in a media position. He just clearly doesn't have the talent. I mean, you might dislike people like Tony Jones or Lee Sales, but, they're actually good at what they do. I mean, they are talented. We might disagree with their political leanings, but with Sam Dastiari, he has no talent at all. I thought it would be good to do a Victoria update, which of course is the, the, the state that I'm from. Uh, what do they call it these days? The uh, Socialist People's Republic of Victoria, something like that? <laughs> yeah, it's quite known to be... Um, Definitely, uh, a name, a name like that would would label it well. <laughs> uh, well, we were told by our uh, dear leaders this week that uh, uh, with the release of the Victorian crime statistics, that uh, the state is actually getting uh, safer with a six point two percent drop in the uh, crime rate. And of course, the the mainstream media ran with this, told us that you know the uh, the uh, crime wave that uh, has been hitting the state is was fake news. Uh, but of course, I actually looked into the crime statistics in detail and violent crime is actually you know which is what we're concerned about is actually on the rise and the uh, what accounted for the the drop in crime was actually the 24 percent uh drop in uh arson so 
you know, sexual offences, uh, uh, robberies, and uh, also crimes of uh, uh, deception. Uh, they, they were all on, on the rise. And it was uh, no less than 24 hours after you know, this, uh, you know, this, this, you know, spin was put on that, you know, we're living in a safer state now. Uh, there were two violent brawls that broke out in Melbourne. There was one on Thursday morning, uh, at, uh, St Kilda Beach where, uh, a, a group of youths described as, uh, African in appearance, uh, uh, started, uh, assaulting and, uh, robbing, uh, uh, beachgoers as well as fighting with each other. And then there was a, on Friday afternoon, there was another brawl in in Collingwood, and uh, th th that uh, they were described by police as uh, being of uh, mixed uh, appearance. Now, the the one in uh, St Kilda that was uh, that was captured on uh, camera by one of the, the witnesses. So that's the uh, that, that's gained the most attention. The one that the one that was in Collingwood uh, wasn't, but it was basically. Yeah, the the government told us like, look at these, you know, statistics that we've put out. You know, it, it uh, you know disproves everything, and yet, you know, twenty four hours later, the the horror of what's going on in Melbourne is uh, before us once again. We see this happening all the time, where governments like to cherry pick figures that um, basically uh, prove their points. So we see this when it comes to even the budget or economics, where they. Uh, pick the figures that they, they think represent um, great improvements and say, oh, yeah, we're responsible for this happening. And the the stuff that isn't so good, they, they try and ignore. And the media, obviously, being on the side of Andrews, uh, definitely did pick the, the figures that looked good rather than the figures that didn't. And as you said, that um, a big percentage of that was arson. That was, um, that was uh, the drop. I mean, it, it, it really says a lot, doesn't it? I mean, violence, uh, violent crimes are on a rise in Victoria. And, and the best way to, to know that is to actually go on the street and ask people themselves. I mean, I've seen a lot of footage where uh, you're getting many shop break-ins by the Apex gang, just people on the street. I mean, these guys are vicious. These guys would attack old ladies for, you know, $20, you know. I mean, they don't muck around. And they're... They're being used by the left as well. The, the left use these uh, criminals from minority groups and basically um, get them to turn, away, uh, turn against uh, decent Australians. I mean, the way they do this is, for instance, uh, with the Milo protests that we saw, they, they go over to their housing commission blocks and say, oh, guys, you know, we've got such a rally. You know, these guys are here to hurt you. They don't like you. You know, they're racist, they're, you know, bigots, whatever else. Oh, let's go and show them, you know, who's boss. And they go, oh, okay, you know, no worries, because they don't know any better. And then they get involved in violent outbursts. I mean, throwing rocks, you know, damaging property. Uh, the, the Apex band, Apex gang really needs to be sorted out. The situation needs to be handled. And you can't trust the Labor government to ever be tough on crime. They never will. And I think it's about time that Victoria becomes safe again, as the slogan says. I mean, people have just had enough of it. And too many innocent people uh, are being victimised and, and are getting hurt out of this. And I'm not saying that, you know, these two brawls, you know, in isolation, you know, d uh, disprove uh, statistics. I'm uh, uh, like I said before, I actually looked at the statistics in detail, and uh, it still shows that you know violent crime is on the rise. But you know, there, uh, you know, other yeah, evidence is you know there's suburbs in Melbourne, you know, such as you know Caroline Springs and Cranbourne, where you know there there's so many home invasions that you know residents are living in fear. They're sleeping with you know baseball bats under their bed. You know, some you know have basically had to you know flee like it's a as a war zone or, uh, or something. You know, there, there, there's a lot of, you know, fear out there, uh, there and, um, you know, it's not, you know, imagined, you know, pe people have been, you know, attacked on the street, you know, in their homes, you know, their, their businesses uh, have, have been robbed. It's, it's, not a, it's not a good place that Melbourne's in. That's exactly right. And these people think they can get away with it. That's the problem. I mean, they've come here 
And they've seen our, our government basically ignore problems that they are committing. So, I mean, this gives them a free pass and they think that they're, they're gods, that they're warriors here. They can do anything they want without any consequences. So, I mean, what kind of message does it say to the bad people that are doing these crimes, that are getting a free pass, but not only to them, but also the, the victims, the good people that are suffering, that are being ignored by the government because these people are being allowed to part participate in these crimes and aren't getting big consequences out of it because, oh, too much paperwork or, oh, we haven't got such and such evidence or, you know, it, there's, always, uh, there's always red tape involved, political correctness involved and it, it just seems that nobody wants to do the hard yards to sort out such a problem that's plaguing the state. Uh, and, and of course, that, were, uh, that wasn't the only news to come out of Victoria this week. Uh, Daniel Andrews, he didn't like the uh, east-west link, so he uh, spent $1 billion uh, worth of taxpayers' money not to build it, but he likes the uh, Westgate Tunnel uh, project, which he's building at the moment, which he is going to fund by uh, increasing tolls on our existing uh, city link uh, motorway, and uh, they're, they're going to be increasing uh 4.25 percent per year uh compounding and tolls are, are going to be extended to i i believe 2045 this is to secure four billion dollars worth of uh, uh funding uh from transurban who is the company that lobbied for this project and also the cost of the road has, has blown out from 5.5 billion to 6.7 billion so I'm all for building more roads, but, you know, Daniel Andrews, he seems to have negotiated a terrible deal. Well, it does seem terrible. I mean, that's a lot of money. Um, I mean, many people are, are looking back at the East-West Link and thinking that was such a better plan, um, considering on the location, uh, what that would have done um, jobs-wise, just, just the infrastructure in general. And they're looking at this and they're thinking, well, what are we really getting for our money here? And not only that, the people have to pay for it um, by the increase in uh, in the ongoing tolls that they're, they're going to have to... I mean, this is going to slug a lot of people. So, I mean, this could be something that really affects him. Uh, I mean, people... One thing people hate is tolls. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it could be a reality that, you know, it's it's just a matter of, um, of how things work and, you know, they're there and we can't do anything, but... At the end of the day, I don't think anyone can really come out and say, oh, you know what, I, I, I love paying, you know, such and such a week on, on the ongoing tolls that, to and from work that I have to use. I mean, this, this is something that really affects people and they might be able to uh, make an impact on the ballot box. I mean, Victorian election, it, it's not that far down the track. So he has to really be careful um, in where he's treading here. And another bit of news from Victoria that's been overlooked is that the CFMEU, they're uh, blockading the uh, container terminal uh, in Melbourne. Uh, the reason that they're doing this is because a uh, union employee was uh, sacked for, uh, they failed a security clearance because of a criminal conviction, which... You know, on the face of it, it seems like, well, if they needed a security clearance to do the job and they failed it, then obviously they're not good for the job. But of course, you know, the, the CFMU, you know, can't have that and, you know, loves to throw their weight around, as we know. And so they've been uh, blockading uh, millions of dollars worth of uh, containers there that's been uh, si uh, sitting idle there. And uh, the Victoria Police and uh, uh, Daniel Andrews' government are just not doing anything about it. Well, Daniel Andrews says, oh, we need to, you know, uh, try and find a conciliation to it. We, as, so, so what, the, the Container Corporation should just, you know, uh, be uh, engaged in negotiation with, you know, people who've, you know, been engaging in, you know, thuggery and intimidation? That, do that doesn't seem like, you know... If, a, 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 good, a good way to, uh, you know, bring parties together. Like, well, the only reason why we're here is because, you know, one, uh, one side, you know, threw their weight around. It's a very bad look. And the CFMEU, um, I mean, they're, they're right 
the worst of the worst when it comes to these unions. And the Andrews government won't do anything about it. No Labor government will do anything about it because they are so uh, beholden and, um, and owned by the unions. I mean, the unions give them so much money um, when it comes to campaigns, elections and whatnot. So there's no way that you'd ever see a Labor Party leader um, being genuine and doing what's right uh, when it comes to unions. I mean, they will always back them no matter how nasty uh, they are being, how dirty the games they're playing. And uh, it's just Labor Party politics. In the United States, all eyes this week were on the uh, Alabama Senate race. Uh, now, Alabama is uh, normally a, a safe uh, state for the uh, Republicans. It uh, previously had uh, two Republican senators and it voted overwhelmingly for Donald Trump in the uh, Electoral College. However, uh, Democrat uh, Doug Jones uh, won the seat uh, at the expense of uh, Roy Moore, who was the Republican candidate. He uh, was a judge and uh, during the campaign, uh, sexual assault assault uh, uh, against uh, minors uh, allegations uh, came up. Uh, he refuted those, but there were several uh, women who came forward to say they were abused by more uh, as uh, teenagers. And so obviously uh, that clearly had an impact on the vote, given that uh, a Democrat won a Senate seat for the, the first time in 25 years. Now, people said it was a loss for Trump because they claimed that this was uh, Trump's candidate, but this was actually fake news because in the Republican primaries, uh, Trump backed uh, Luther Strange and uh, Trump uh, said so in his tweet following the uh, uh, Moore's loss. And, and of course, this is what the media does uh, you know, all the time, they, you know, uh, anything, if, if something goes wrong for the Republicans, it, it's, it's Trump's fault, even though Moore was the choice of the Republican establishment. Yeah, I think this really shows that um, the Republican establishment is starting to lose a grip. It's, uh, it, it's, it's funny, as you said, how the media really turned things uh, a certain way and then reported in a certain way. But I don't think it really is uh, much of a loss to Trump. It, um, it is a, a very red state, Alabama. It's not a, a state that often goes Democrat, but has in the past, a very long time ago. But, I mean, when you have a candidate that have, has rape allegations um, put to him, and uh, obviously the Democrats uh, campaign very hard on that, I mean, it's very, very hard to, to be able to win with such a candidate that has that kind of uh, baggage on him. And I mean, we have to keep, uh, keep in mind here that he wasn't actually uh, charged for these. This is only allegations. So, I mean, it is harsh for, um, for people to judge him, even though it wasn't um, a conviction and was only an allegation overall. But when it comes to politics, any, uh, um, any sort of dirt that uh, the opposition can come up with, and, um, I mean, it, it sticks. It's, it's very, uh, very rough how, how it works. So it was, it was very tough to be able to um, go against um, allegations and be able to win it. I mean, we have many other seats um, that are blue seats, that have had Republicans, such as uh, Chris Christie, for instance, in New Jersey. I mean, um, there, there is a range of Republican uh, governors of blue states. Uh, so, I mean, it is a surprise, but considering the circumstances, I think one can say, you know what, well, I mean, if these allegations never were here, then, I mean, Roy Moore would have won quite comfortably. Yeah, I mean, any, you know, uh, Republican, you know, candidate who just had the, you know, standard CV would have won easily. And yes, you are right to point out that these were, you know, allegations, but you have to remember, you know, this is, uh, you know, politics, which is, you know, a different mm -hmm. game. And you also have to remember that it was only 
uh, a week ago that uh, Democrat Senator Al Franken resigned when uh, several women came forward to, uh, to say that um, he uh, engaged in sexual inappropriateness with them. So the standard had been set by the Democrats that if you've got this cloud over you, you shouldn't be in the Senate. And, and so this was, is what uh, Moore was faced with. And of course, if he had won, it would have uh, it would have continued to, you know, dog him uh, when he was in the Senate. Now, the reason that I, I think that Trump, you know, backed him so so uh, much in the final weeks is because, you know, Trump himself knows what it's like to be, um, you know, at the centre of false, uh, you know, sexual assault allegations, and also because, you know, he's not one to, you know, throw, you know, people under the, under the bus. You know, he, you know, he back, uh, back, uh, backs these people. You know, he, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't want to, you know, give, you know, his enemies, you know, a, a taste of blood. And you know, uh, sometimes that, you know, can be a, a weakness in politics. It can, but um, as as you said, I mean, leadership qualities. Uh, to be a strong leader, you have to back the people. Um, that, that, that you have. I mean, uh, so if Trump came out and actually said, oh, you know, I'm not supporting him, and uh, I mean, it would have been terrible. I mean, it would have been disastrous. And uh, I mean, it would have been um, a, a big uh, fight within the party over this. Uh, I mean, as leader, as long as the person um, hasn't had any uh, actual convictions proven against him, you can't come out and um, and rubbish the person when they've been actually chosen to represent your party. I mean, you have to defend him. You have to stand by him until there is reason not to. And even uh, an allegation isn't a good enough reason to um, rubbish someone and to go against him. I mean, until they are proven, all it is is an allegation. And I mean... At the moment, there's a lot of scandals coming out about these uh, these incidences um, in Hollywood and with uh, politicians, celebrities, for instance. So how many of these um, are true and legit and how many aren't? Because um, if it was that easy to be able to make up stories, then people can be doing this in future if there's somebody that they don't like as a candidate and they're opposing them, then they can get... Um, some women forward and they can just make up stories and it can damage them and, and make them lose. I mean, it's something that can happen and don't get me wrong. Of course, it's, um, there, there would be after they've been proven to be, um, lying, then they would have, um, charges put against them. But some people don't care because at the end of the day, if their particular, um, I, ideal uh, a goal is to stop someone from winning a, a particular seat um, therefore d and destroying their career then they don't mind copying a fine or, or, or other repercussions afterwards if their goal is achieved so it's it's just the way um, the way it the way it works unfortunately and until there's convictions in place I mean it, it, you just don't know who's telling the truth and who isn't. And the ones telling the truth, then I would fully support. But the ones that aren't are the problem. And did Roy Moore do it? The only person that knows is Roy Moore. I mean, until he's proven guilty, we have to give him um, the the doubt. We, we we have to we have to. It's reasonable doubt in place here. So we we he's innocent until he is proven guilty. End of story. And of course, the political uh, implications uh, of this win for the Democrats is now the uh, Senate is now in the 51-49 uh, in favour of the Republicans, which is going to uh, make it more difficult for uh, Trump to get his uh, legislative agenda through Congress. And this is the, the only uh, part of his presidency which is you know, found difficult because you know, the, the Republican establishment, you know, don't like him, ha have never liked him. And of course, you only need, uh, you know, one or two 
to, uh, Republican senators to say, you know, I'm not supporting this to, you know, basically, you know, sabotage, you know, where, what, what Trump's trying to do because, you know, there, there's, there's, there's the two, um, you know, left-leaning Republican senators, uh, uh, Lisa Murkowski uh, and Susan Collins. They're, they're already most of the time, you know, vote, vote with Democrats. So pretty much, and there was, you know, Marco Rubio who said that he was going to vote against the, the tax plan. So it's the, you can say that this is a, a loss for Trump because it basically gives uh, the Republicans now, with the numbers reduced, more opportunity to, you know, uh, basically try and tear him down. Uh, even though, even though Roy Moore was their choice over Trump's candidate. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he he really did nothing wrong here. Um, I mean, he uh, stood behind a candidate that uh, hadn't had any convictions against him. I mean, um, it might not have been the ideal candidate. I'm sure they could have found a better candidate, but nevertheless, it wasn't his first choice candidate that he um, he supported. It was the the choice of the Republican establishment. So, um, which which only proves that it wasn't his uh, his doing um, the, what what has happened. And like you said, I mean, um, it's going to be very difficult to get anything through now because there is uh, a particular number of rebels within the party that very uh, much dislike Trump. So any time they, um, they get, they will vote against him and therefore his uh, abilities to get things through is going to be very, very hard. I mean, um, even uh, somebody like John McCain, for instance, um, there, there's many in the party that um, are, are more moderate, more established candidates that uh, don't like um, the, the conservative, the, the, the nationalist uh, type approaches to policies. And he's going to find it very difficult. And this um, could cause a bit of chaos for him and the party in general. Yeah, it's certainly uh, going to be uh, an interesting 2018 for uh, Trump and his agenda. Uh, but that's all we've got time for. So thank you once again, uh, Damien, for, for coming on and discussing the, the Newsweek with me. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. A reminder that voting is open for the 2017 Unshackler Awards. There are 10 awards with 10 nominees each, with the winners determined by a poll of our followers and announced on Australia Day. So far, both the Regressive of the Year and the Patriot of the Year categories have been posted, so make sure you get voting. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.